Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ryan Berg, and I'm a senior fellow with the Americas program at CSIS. I'm also the director of the Future of Venezuela Initiative at CSIS. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on assessing the impact of artisanal and small scale and illegal mining in the Amazon. Before we formally begin, let's take care of logistics. This event will last approximately 60 to 90 minutes. Following the panelists' remarks and a moderated discussion, we will field questions from the audience. Please submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live Questions button on the event webpage. Today, we will also have simultaneous interpretation. At the bottom of your screen, please click the globe button that says Interpretation, and then select the language you wish to listen in. Ahora, para nuestra audiencia hispanohablante, hoy tendremos interpretación simultánea. En el recuadro, recuadro de la pantalla de Zoom, encontrarán un icono con una esfera que dice Interpretation. Ahí, por favor, seleccione el idioma de su preferencia. Again, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for a conversation on assessing the impact of artisanal and small scale and illegal mining in the Amazon. Artisanal and small scale and illegal mining in the Andes Amazon region has direct ties to environmental degradation, human rights abuses, and the financing of transnational organized crime. Unfortunately, ASM and illegal mining have been increasing in prevalence along with the rise of uh, prices and demands for minerals, straining the environment and threatening security throughout the Americas. According to the World Resources Institute, ASM and illegal mining affect millions of people throughout the Amazon. In addition to unsafe labor practices, coercion by criminal groups, and human and sexual trafficking, communities throughout the region suffer from widespread mercury pollution. ASM is now the leading source of mercury poisoning in the region. The Amazon region contains more than half of the Earth's remaining tropical forests, covering more than 1.4 billion acres, and is home to over 30 million people. The more than 350 different indigenous communities of the Amazon are especially vulnerable to coercion by criminal groups and the impacts of environmental crime and degradation. The spread of unregulated mining operations throughout the region has led to rampant deforestation. In Colombia, for instance, more than 68% of the country's loss of vegetation can be attributed to illegal exploitation. Furthermore, these unregulated mining practices contribute, contribute to the growing regional security threats posed by criminal groups, such as the National Liberation Army, ELN, and the dissident members of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC-D. These groups collect billions of dollars in revenue from laundered mining profits every year, while also finding safe haven in ungoverned mining areas. These criminal activities lead to participation in other crimes, such as wildlife and human trafficking, while also undermining U.S. efforts to pressure the Maduro regime in Venezuela on human rights and democracy issues. Governments, multilateral development organizations, civil society, and the private sector must work together to align policies that confront ASM and illegal mining. Through proper legislation and industry regulation, the mining industry has the potential to be a sustainable and essential industry contributing to the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of people in the Amazon region. In its current state, however, the industry is unsustainable, unethical, or, ins or insecure. Today, we have a distinguished panel of guests to help us analyze the human, environmental, and security costs associated with ASM and illegal mining in the Amazon, and the potential for mining to become a more sustainable enterprise with proper regulation. Our keynote speaker today is Mr. Gene Thomas. Mission Director of the United States Agency for International Development in Peru. Mr. Thomas has worked with USAID for over two decades. In addition to his role as USAID Peru Mission Director, he previously served as USAID Haiti Mission Director from 2016 to 2019, and as Director of the Office of Caribbean Affairs from 2014 to 2015. Mr. Thomas previously worked for the US Environmental Protection Agency and pursued advanced studies in environmental management and sustainable development. He is an expert on issues of democracy, governance, human rights, and environmental policy. Mr. Thomas, thank you for joining us today. Our second panelist is Dr. Anna Sederstad. 
Deputy Executive Director of the Inter-American Association for Environmental Defense, also known by its Spanish acronym, AIDA. Dr. Sedostov has worked in international environmental law for over 20 years, both with AIDA and with the international program at Earth Justice. She has worked on several cases representing communities affected by mining in multiple countries and has provided expert input and technical support to governments throughout the region. Dr. Sedostov, thank you for joining us today. And our third panelist is Mr. Enrique Ortiz, Senior Program Director of the Andes Amazon Fund. Mr. Ortiz has helped fund conservation agencies in the Andes Amazon region for over two decades and previously co-founded the Andes Amazon Initiative at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Amazon Conservation Association. He is a renowned leader in biodiversity and ecosystem conservation. Mr. Ortiz, thank you very much for joining us today. Our panelists today will frame the conversation by assessing current efforts to combat the impacts of ASM and illegal mining, sharing expert insights from their experiences in conservation and development policy, and by outlining a proper regulatory framework that promotes interagency and cross-sectoral collaboration for the mining industry. With that, Jean, over to you for your keynote remarks. Thank you, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ryan uh, said, I'm uh, Jean Thomas, the USAID Mission Director here in Peru. I'm also Director of our South American Regional Environmental Program, which covers uh, six uh, countries of the Amazon region uh, that we support with activities based out of Lima. Uh, USAID's environment portfolio in Peru and the region focuses on biodiversity conservation and combating environmental crimes, promoting sustainable and legal economic development, and supporting partner countries to adapt to climate challenges while decreasing greenhouse gas emissions. I'm happy to be with you here today to talk about a topic that is critically important to the environment, human health, the security of Peru and other Amazonian countries, and that also uh, contributes to security threats uh, in the United States and abroad. Uh, that's the interconnectedness of illegal gold mining, organized crime, and climate change. As clearly highlighted at the COP in Glasgow and through administration priorities, conservation of the Amazon rainforest is essential for our global efforts to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. A key driver of deforestation in Peru and a major threat to the Amazon rainforest is illegal gold mining, especially in the region of Madre de Dios, Madre de Dios in southeast Peru, close to the Bolivian border. The increased price of gold over the past 15 years has led to um, a significant increase in illegal mining in Peru. And the complete stripping of all trees and vegetation on over 370,000 acres. That's the loss of an area of primary rainforest equivalent to over eight times the size of Washington, D.C. When you fly over the Pampa region of Madre de Dios, it looks like a desert wasteland that goes on and on for a vast distance. This pattern is one of the key factors driving deforestation that threatens to turn the Amazon rainforest from a carbon sink into a source of carbon emissions. In addition, illegal mining in the Amazon is closely tied to the use of mercury, which has severe neurological impacts in humans, as well as cascading effects in the environment. Despite the Minamata Convention, which aims to protect human health and the environment from mer mercury pollution, we estimate that a staggering 180 tons of mercury are released into the environment every year in Peru. Some of the mercury is released as toxic fumes and inhaled by humans as the mercury is burned off to release tiny specks and flakes of gold that are collected from alluvial soils. Studies by Mercer University in association with the Center for Scientific Innovation in the Amazon, CINCIA, a collaboration between Wake Forest University and USAID, found very high levels of atmospheric mercury in Madre de Dios near schools and markets close to gold dealers. Mercury also contaminates riverine systems through mine tailings where it enters the food web and can bioaccumulate to toxic levels in longer lived predatory species such as river fish. Studies supported by USAID indicate that migratory species of Amazonian catfish have unhealthy levels of mercury contamination. These fish are the main source of protein for indigenous people in the Amazon who live in areas far from mining operations and have resulted in levels of mercury in their blood above those approved by the EPA. This situation is particularly of concern for pregnant women and small children. Fortunately, as a result of our work with Sensia and Wake Forest, 
there is greater awareness of this issue and authorities in Madre Dios have been able to issue warnings and recommendations about which fish are better options for general consumption to reduce the risk of mercury contamination. In addition to the environmental issues, the social dynamics associated with illegal mining are quite complex. In the field, we frequently see small-scale miners who are migrants from other rural areas outside the Amazon. In some cases, these miners may be victims of trafficking. Increasingly, transnational criminal organizations and narcotics traffickers that are the main buyers and traffickers of illegal gold are behind these operations and the associated violence, extortion, money laundering, forced labor, and even sexual exploitation. In countries such as Peru, illegal gold leaves the country through mafia rings that facilitate moving of gold over the country's very porous borders and often bring in an unregulated mercury to continue the cycle. In Colombia, illegal mining is associated with illegal armed groups, and this fuels violence, assassinations of indigenous people, and mass displacements of rural communities. The scale of illegal mining in some areas, such as Madre de Dios, is so expansive that entire economies are built around it. Experts estimate that um, nearly 70% of the economy of Madre de Dios region is tied to illegal gold mining. To address these challenges in Peru, USAID and the US Embassy are working with the government of Peru, universities, civil society, and the private sector through a number of initiatives. Using cutting edge research, our projects are developing methods to rehabilitate the areas that have been deforested and degraded by mining operations. Our CINCIA project with Wake Forest has developed the model that the government of Peru is now using to restore habitat in areas such as Tambopata National Reserve of Madre de Dios. And Ciencia is running the largest reforestation and remediation experiment in the Americas with more than 120 acres of experimental pots, testing more than 70 native Amazonian species. We're also supporting a Conservation X Labs initiative that uses grand challenges to harness a global community of solvers and entrepreneurs to incentivize bold and unconventional approaches to conservation. Through USAID's partnership with Conservation X Labs, we will soon have the first set of innovative solutions to field tests for acceleration and scaling to conserve biodiversity and improve the health and security of communities in the Amazon basin. In 2017, the US government signed a memorandum of understanding with the Peruvian government. This framework has helped us to be more strategic in our interventions as it covers prevention and enforcement activities while considering the impacts of protected areas and indigenous peoples. Also in 2017, the U.S. Embassy in Peru issued a commercial advisory encouraging buyers, sellers, traders, and refiners of gold to conduct additional due diligence, due diligence as part of their risk mitigation to account for the influx of illegally mined Peruvian gold into existing supply chains. At the policy level, in Peru, we are working hand in hand with the national and subnational mining authorities to promote legality through mining formalization and manuals for miners on better environmental safeguards. I'm also very excited to highlight a recent success from USAID's work in Colombia under the Legal Gold Project with the Swiss Better Gold Initiative. This project has, also, has been able to demonstrate to the Colombian government and small scale miners that it is possible to formalize illegal miners and produce gold in a legal manner without using mercury while reducing the impact of mines in tropical forests. As a result, we estimate that this has prevented the release of 70 tons of mercury into the environment and legal gold is being sold in the international market at a premium price, generating a tangible economic incentive for more miners to become formalized. With effective and enforced policies in place, the private sector could also be an important part of the solution. The ability to buy and sell gold with certification of the legal provenance to ensure legality along the value chain could contribute to premium prices for operations that comply with social and environmental safeguards. The private sector can also be active in providing financial support, acting as brokers or establishing banks in association with mining federations and the regional authorities that could connect with national and international markets and attract um, target audiences such as responsible jewelers and other green gold consumers. And at the policy level, uh, we have some winners of opportunity as this year there will be a general election in Colombia and subnational elections for regional governors and local authorities in Peru. It's important to position these issues with the candidates and also with the newly elected officials. Uh, in Peru, uh, Peru is preparing to draft new legislation targeting artisanal and small scale gold mining 
Um, USAID's PREVENT project, which supports Peru's uh, efforts to fight environmental crimes, has already produced policy recommendations and will actively contribute to this new law that will be presented to the Peruvian Congress later this year. We are also encouraging countries in the region to do what Peru has already done, to incorporate illegal mining in their legislation as an organized crime, as this, as this leads to stricter sentences for the offenders. And we will continue to promote media engagement with major newspapers and radio stations in collaboration with science and evidence-based investigative journalists and policy publications such as Manga Bay and Ojo Publico to raise greater awareness with the public. So now you may be asking yourself, what can you do? In the US and other significant markets for gold, we need to do our part to promote greater accountability. Right now, a simple declaration indicating, I am bringing gold into the country is all that is required upon arrival at a port of entry such as the Miami airport. But we have no way of knowing if that gold is illegal or not. We can also find out which companies have signed the No Dirty Gold Pledge, an international campaign working to ensure that gold mining operations respect human rights and the environment. The Amazon Aid Foundation lists a number of companies that have signed the pledge, such as Earthworks and the Oxfam, uh, Oxfam NGO, Cartier, Tiffany, and many other jewelers and retailers, such as QVC, Target, and Walmart. If you're considering a gold purchase, ask jewelers whether they have a collection made with certified fair trade or fair mined gold. And finally, each of us can spread awareness, uh, spread awareness of this issue by sharing our knowledge about the impact that illegal gold mining is having in the Amazon. And for information um, on all of USAID's work on illegal gold in Peru, Colombia, and across the Amazon, you can go to USAID's websites. Um, and if you're interested in the research that we've been supporting uh, related to the impacts caused by illegal gold, you can go to the Prevent and Cincia websites, that's C-I-N-C-I-A websites, where you'll find um, additional information, including policy briefs, manuals, analyses, proven recommendations, and workable solutions that were tested in the Peruvian Amazon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean, for those wonderful keynote remarks. Um, Dr. Sederstoff, your opening remarks. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. And thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Jean, to the many, many problems and congratulations on all that you have accomplished in Peru. The truth is that if we could replicate everything that is going on in Peru and all of the countries in the Amazon, we would make a great deal of problem, project, <laughs> progress on this, uh, on this issue. So as you just heard, this is an extremely complex problem. It requires coordinated international action. And part of the reason for that is because the, the countries in the Amazon, it's like a block with houses where they all have a shared backyard, but there are no fences separating the backyards. So for all the pro progress that we might make in a country like Peru, if illegal mining or if mining in general is permitted freely in Bolivia or Venezuela, then the bad actors shift from one backyard to another. And so that's one of the reasons why we need coordinated international act action right now. Um, the current isolated efforts, they're great, but they have mostly local and short-term impact. So to truly protect the Amazon, which is so important for climate change, we require much more. And this may seem overwhelming. It, it really is. It's, a, it's an almost intractable problem, but we need to take action on it right away. So the other thing to remember is that this is not just a South American problem. The root cause of the gold mining problem in South America lies not even in the actions of people purchasing jewelry in the United States, but it lies in the international financial system and trade that is built around gold. So that system, the financial system and the jewelry industry are what really must change in order for us to make true progress. Um, so far there have been uh, has been a great deal of research and learning and attempts at improved governance and regulation and mitigation of impacts, and that's all great. But truth is we need to stop doing the equivalent of putting band-aids in different places when we're really confronting a system that's hemorrhaging on all fronts. And that is unfortunately what is happening currently in the Amazon. 
So what is the problem? Jean described this, but, but I like to start thinking about it as a misnomer. We talk about artisanal and small scale mining and people might think that that doesn't sound so bad, but the truth is that this is in no way small scale mining. Yes, each individual actor may be working on a small scale, but taken together, this is an activity that's happening on a very large scale. The process is basically complete deforestation, water blasting of river basins and edges, as in the image that you see in my background, which is a Amazonian river that has been turned into a gold mine. Uh, then they use PVC pipes to suck up the sediment after the forest has been cut down, and they pass the sediment through a wooden sleuth to separate out the gold particles. The gold particles are mixed with mercury, and the mercury is burnt off to generate gold and a lot of water, uh, mercury vapor that goes into the air and into the water. So what is the impact? It leaves behind absolutely deforested and unproductive soils. And we don't, we are working on trying to figure out how to mitigate that damage, but we do not yet have the solution to how to reforest the areas that are impacted by mining at the scale that the problem is happening. So thinking again about the scale of small scale mining, so-called so small scale mining versus what we call large scale mining, which is open pit mining. It's important to remember that open pit mi mining has a whole host of its own problems. <laughs> and I am in no way advocating open pit mining instead of, of small scale mining. But if you look at, for example, the largest three mines in the world, which are in Uzbekistan, United States, and in Russia, they annually produce about 150 tons of gold. Mining in the Amazon produces a little bit more, 170. But those three mines combined take up 1,300 hectares of land. Whereas mining in the Amazon, in Peru alone in 2017, 11,000 hectares were deforested for mining in one year. So if you take, and who knows how accurate all of these numbers are perfectly, but it's said that about 50 times as much land is deforested annually, globally, for the activity of so-called small scale mining as what is used for these three largest mines. So basically the, the small scale mining is generating only slightly more gold, but using a tremendous amount more land. In addition to that, it has the mercury problem that was just discussed and that therefore I won't go into. So what do we need to do? I would say that the first thing that we need to do is to think very strategically about what the problem really is and how to solve the problem. And the truth is that the problem lies in the international financial system and the fact that the price of gold continues to go up. Gold is actually not a substance that's used for very much. It's used for jewelry, it's used in some electronics, but generally gold is hoarded in vaults, by governments, and in jewelry chests around the world. So the only thing that we're doing with this extra added gold that we're doing is sticking it in places to store it. One potential way of increasing the supply of gold without harming any ecosystem anywhere would be for banks to sell off some of their gold or for nations to do so. Now, I'm not an economist and I'm not gonna go into what the impacts of doing so would be, but we have um, around 20 times the global annual gold demand for jewelry and technology is, um, is, is stored currently. So we could go for years without doing any mining anywhere on our planet and we wouldn't run out of gold. Um, and, and again, situations like the pandemic are really exacerbating this problem. The, according to the World Gold Can Council, the yearly average price of gold in 2021 was 40% higher than it was in 2018. And that's largely because of the pandemic. So the price of gold is one problem. The extreme poverty and migration of vulnerable communities who can't afford not to mine because it's a choice between feeding their children and mining is the other significant challenge. 
A third significant challenge is the fact that there is vastly insufficient funding for and capacity among the actors who are charged with the enforcement of laws in the protected and other areas. And finally, as was mentioned before, it's the relative power of criminal entities that end up serving as de facto governments in some places and the threats that these um, these entities make against all of the people, whether it be somebody in the government or from communities who are trying to protect the environment. So what do we need to do? From our perspective, the first thing that we need to do is motivate tremendous international collaboration, not just within South America, but globally. Um, we need to share experience, we need to share funds, and governments need to be able to see civil society as valued partners and NGOs must be willing to work with governments and with the private sector, because this is a problem that we all need to solve together. Research is important, but we even more so than new research, sharing existing information can go a long way. So we need to build these international coalitions. In order to bring down the price of gold, we can think about international financial policies. We can think about trying to affect the culture change via campaigns. Um, but it is clear that while the price of gold remains where it is, and while gold is available for free in the areas where there are millions of impoverished people, we're not going to be able to stop that mining and we're not going to be able to protect the Amazon. So on the legal front, we need to address existing regulatory gaps in some nations. We have to improve rule of law and governance in local priority, area, priority areas. We need to um, eliminate incentives for promoting these extractive activities. Um, because in some places, it's a precondition to be able to have property rights to, to be mining in some of these areas. Um, we have to improve consideration of cu cumulative and secondary impacts. A lot of the mining is currently being driven by infrastructure uh, construction. And so the impact of the fact that when, where there is a road, there will be mining, where there is a river or either via, there will be mining. That needs to be considered when international agencies and governments are deciding to build that road. We need to improve territorial planning. We need to clearly prohibit mining in areas that are the most sensitive and uh, as well as the most harmful technologies. We need to increase penalties, but not at the source, not these poor miners. We have to figure out how to actually get at the people who are profiting from this mining. Um, and in so doing, we have to create a resource, a multinational strategy con to confront the illegal gold mining and smuggling. As was mentioned, I could, I'm not allowed to stick $10,000 in my suitcase and travel south without declaring it. But I could load it up with hundreds of thousands of dollars of gold and travel along and claim that it was all my jewelry that I was going to wear at some event. And there has been tremendous resistance to the creation of increased restrictions and tracking of the transport of gold. And that comes largely from the financial sectors because gold is a commodity. And, and we want to, as a financial entity, uh, promote the ability to trade in gold. But if we're going to protect the Amazon, we need to prevent that flow of gold to be so free. Currently, gold is supposedly the currency of choice for illegal actors. They pay each other in gold. Um, and we need to improve the traceability. Right now, gold is coming into, illegal gold is coming into common commerce either because it's pretended to be recycled gold, recycled gold sellers buy it cheap, or in many countries, there are large scale official mines that purchase gold from other sources and they feed it into their production, thus legalizing it. So tracking and tracing where the gold is coming from is another significant uh, challenge that stands before us as we try to address this problem. Now, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Sedasov, so much that you uh, you put on the table there, and I think you did a really wonderful job explaining why uh, the small scale and artisanal sometimes isn't so small scale and uh, artisanal. Um, Enrique, over to you for your opening remarks. 
Thank you, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank to the organizers of the seminar, uh, CSIS, and all those involved. Uh, I, first, I, first, I first wanted to first uh, say something about my background. I am more uh, an ecologist by training. Uh, I've been in environmental issues for, for a long time, over 40 years working on environmental issues, but also been involved in the gold mining issues since uh, the whole, I guess, scandal of gold mining started in Peru in 2008. Uh, I currently I work for the Andes Amazon Fund. I'm a senior program director, and because of that, I'm involved in in conservation issues and problems uh, so much in the whole Andean Amazonian countries as well as in Brazil. So that keeps me going around and actually witnessing and comparing what what is happening in all these areas. Regarding uh, uh, illegal gold mining or Amazonian alluvial gold mining. It's a subject that has dominated the horrors on environmental news for, for over a decade, apart from taking some time from my sleep every night. But uh, in these 10 minutes I have now, uh, I'm not going to repeat or highlight those impacts of illegal mining we all see uh, every time and, uh, and because that will take all my time. Uh, we keep repeating them and adding new ones to, uh, to them but instead, um, based on this experience, I tell you, I told you, I'm going to uh, throw a, a few perspectives on alluvial uh, illegal gold mining in the Amazon. Uh, throw, uh, throw a few bold statements that may sound as dreamy and realistic, but they are not. I assure you, they are not. I am ready to develop the arguments for each of them, uh, and some of them may contrast with uh, what you heard from Jean as well as from. From Anna, uh, but you know, um, it is not a criticism, it just it is a perspective of myself. First, you know, I contend that the Amazon alluvial gold mining should be completely banned, period. A cost benefit as, uh, assessment supports this. It is not an irreplaceable necessity of poor people as perceived, but a flagrant result of low cost, illegal, low hanging fruits. When, when taking into account social health, environmental and societal impacts, it doesn't make any sense for anyone. It should be uh, at the same level as narco traffic is or the use of Nazi pesticides, family violence, and altogether it's a crime as it is. Second, there is such a thing as gold, uh, green gold mining. Uh, efforts to focus on finding kosher solutions are not being realistic to the nature of the Amazonian fluvial illegal mining. Illegal alluvial gold mining is based on an atomized low cost model. Efforts on finding ways to extract gold with technology may work in the promotional video or for some NGOs to pay finding, but at the end, they only work when they are heavily subsidized under the eye of a donor or a supporter. Uh, fighting the end users in, uh, in that perspective is also cosmetic and largely ir irrelevant. It only covers a small fraction of 1% and by no means will make any dent to the activity. Good intention though. Three, formalization is just an issue be seen as a transitional strategy and not as an end. Formalization has served as a strategy to make mining still illegal until new notice. See the case of Bolivia. They found that a way to stop illegal uh, mining was formalizing it and making it legal. We no change in any way the activity that is, carried, that is being carried out and is still making a profit for the government. In Peru, we just heard uh, recently that Congress approved, uh, uh, by the way, with a blessing of all parties, be it the right or the left, they just extended a moratorium for informal, informal mining uh, for another four years. So we have to be fully aware that it is a trick that uses all these legal loopholes to continue doing the same. The transitional part where I refer is that it should be seen more as a strategy to choke activity in time, which was, the, by the way, the original strategy when, when the government, in, uh, uh, when Antonio Brack was uh, the first uh, environmental minister in Peru way back in 2008. Uh, fourth, we should review our strategy and narrative in order to achieve, to achieve the first statement I made about banning the Amazon, uh, Amazon and fluvial illegal mining. We have been seeing this issue mainly as an environmental issue. And I contend that we should stop that, that we should refrain the ideas into more human oriented issue that has a cost to society at the individual and collective level, and not only to those communities that are close to the areas where gold is being extracted. Uh, the numbers show that illegal gold mining is actually 
uh, not a, a more than an environmental issue is a, is, a, is a health issue, it's a human society issue. And if you see the numbers, uh, for example, in Peru, Anna was giving the numbers of 11,000 hectares in, in one year, in one of the worst years, it represents 4% of the deforestation in the country in that year. You know, in some ways, it has distracted us from other environmental issues. But the truth of the nature is that the environmental impacts of it are not as, as they are seen as the problem. They are part of the problem, no question. I believe that the only way they're gonna change this ever, get, ever getting worse scenario is through a social perspective based on human health issues and what, the, what, and what is of importance to individuals and collective groups. Although basic research on impact of gold mining ecosystems are important and also interesting, their needs are more on those subjects that we know little and are not so obvious, such as the impacts, uh, for example, of mercury in the cognitive abilities of children, uh, human health issues, the impact of pre on pregnant women, children, and the elderly. Uh, if you go to a hospital uh, in Puerto Maldonado, the epicenter of gold mining, and you ask a doctor how many cases you have of, 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 of um, uh, poisoning, and they tell you none. You know, it is because there is not a perception that this actually is bad for your health, and also uh, it is not focusing on the right people. I trust that a change of strategy can mobilize those who really can make a change, women and mothers. And as a second part of my remark, I would also highlight, would like to highlight the differences among uh, gold mining modes, because there is a great difference between each of those. And the difference has great, but also differential implications. The river mining that we saw recently for in media, the hundreds of barges tied together in a line in the Madeira River, it's a completely different story than what you see, for example, in, in, the, in those dramatic images of Southeastern Peru uh, or uh, the invasions of in indigenous lands in Brazil, or what you see in Suriname, in, in, in Guyana, and of course in Colombia. Uh, we show uh, different scenarios that are very different by themselves, uh, among, among themselves, because they are also based on different political realities. And, and as such, they require different strategies. As I said, uh, the, human, the, human, the impacts are quite different beyond the obvious. Along the same lines, uh, small scale mining that is not alluvial, being on the mines or holes uh, are a different case. And as such, they have their own set of issues uh, and perhaps uh, solutions. But we should not put all the mining types in the same bag. Where are we? Amazonian illegal mining is high risk, low cost operation, and such cannot be carried out in a way that is being carried out today, yeah, which is atomized and their small budgets, even though all of them account for a big one, but they are small uh, entrepreneurs in some ways that are operating and paying uh, um, fee for, for their, the position where they are. Gold mining, it is like an oil, uh, like an oil exploration and extraction or even nuclear, nuclear energy production. It is a high risk, high cost operation. Uh, and those operations, like I said, for example, oil requires uh, high investments that include safety and technical capacities to deal with uh, uh, also worst case scenarios, remediation, and in some cases offsetting. But the way that Luga gold mining is being carried out under small mining operations with high profits in many cases, it is a completely uh, in a complete labor and social informality, it just responds to a low cost, profitable hanging fruit that relies on corruption and the weakness of society. I personally do not see a solution as long as we recognize that it is not a product of, of poverty. It is not, uh, but it is more a product of the defeats of society or the effects of society and regulations, where breaking the law has a very low cost and hardly any consequences to the offenders. If you get caught with a kilo of cocaine, you go to prison right away. You get a call with a kilo of gold, you lose a kilo. You know, it's a very a different, different story. I conclude saying that if we want to stop it, we have to change the premises of how we see it and why it is and what kind of information, information we need and promote the more active involvement of people as the ones that can stop it. It is people who have children and families, people who care for the environment from which they make a living or uh, uh, more than tree huggers like me. Uh, the metrics must be different than hectares deforested or how much mercury is in fish or insects or different uh, types of ecosystem. It must, it must be more 
in how people are losing their health. For example, information from hospitals and their children getting behind in school. Additionally, we need to, uh, to, need, we need to use smart media in a way that is capable in changing society as we see this is doing it today. We have made great advances in monitoring and documenting impacts and we have uh, very few successes and we should keep doing it, no question. But we need to shift the strategy into a different kind of action that sets the motion to obtain the right information to involve everyone and those who care for the future of their children. Those are the ones that vote. Uh, and, and I would like to final, finalize that and, and I will be ready to uh, answer any question and defend the points I just made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enrique, a very strong opening statement, and I imagine we'll have uh, some differing views on the panel, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, the first thing I want to do is, is uh, ask Dr. Dr. Sedestov a question, because um, we've heard throughout a, a couple presentations now that uh, gold is a really difficult mineral to trace. We've heard about tracing efforts and why tracing efforts have come up short. Um, we've got processes for other types of minerals like the Kimberley process and others. Uh, so what makes gold different, right? You've got a PhD in chemistry, if I'm not mistaken. Give us a, a very sort of lay person's understanding of why it is that gold manages to evade our best efforts um, at tracing. Okay, um, well, so for starters, gold is very valuable. So you, you can transport a fairly significant value of gold in not very much weight. So it can go undetected as it's being transported. I could stick a kilo of gold in my suitcase and I could fly all over the continent and I would bet you a fair amount of money that nobody would find it. So in order for anybody to even trace it, they have to first find it, right? So that's one issue. The second issue is that you can melt it down and it all melts together, right? So I can't do it in my house, but I know that you can just compile a whole bunch of gold jewelry and you basically heat it up and it all becomes one big golden mess that you then pour into bars. So you can mix it, right? And that makes it difficult. The atoms, the molecules fl float together and they can't, you can't trace them easily when that happens. So yes, there are probably chemical ways that somebody could actually look at the specific gold coming from the Anacocha gold mine and then they could then they could identify that later. But if I'm trying to hide gold, then I can do, and where it came from, I can do that by mixing it with lots of other gold. And so I, I, I hope that maybe answers your question without getting into too much chemistry. No, it does. I think that it's important for listeners to understand what makes gold a little bit different uh, and, and more easily transported and uh, able to evade detection in any sort of tracing systems and processes that we might try to put in place, because it was something that was mentioned in all of the, in all of the opening remarks. Right. Uh, and, and just to, to, to put it into perspective, so $10,000 worth of gold is about, is less than six ounces of gold. So it's less than half a pound of stuff that you need to transport in order to exceed that $10,000 limit. Right, so we're talking about something that can fit in in, in my pocket um, and and worth quite a bit of money. That's, That's very right. helpful. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sedestov. Gene, I want to go to to you and ask about the the regulatory environment. Um, we heard Enrique say that um, efforts at formalization uh, have come up short. Uh, we we've often heard the phrase, especially with respect to ASM, artisanal and small scale mining, that it, it doesn't pay for me to formalize. Um, is there anything in your mind about streamlining the process or, or any kind of formalization that, that we need to do that would help uh, move, move the situation forward? Or is this a, an area that's not so fruitful? Well, there's some, some recent efforts to um, increase uh, the number of formalized non-mercury-based miners in Colombia and Peru. Um, it's been very slow going compared to the, the actual number of miners. Um, and it's um, a, there, 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 there needs to be more effort in this regard. Um, I think there's like a thousand, far, a thousand miners in uh, Choco that have been formalized 
and um, 350 or something maybe in Madre de Dios, and it's a drop in the bucket, but it's a beginning. Um, and what, ne what they need is to have a better understanding of techniques uh, and that, that sharing of that information uh, in order for, um, for miners to, to produce non-mercury uh, gold um, and to do it in a way that is less damaging to the environment. But it's a very, it's a huge challenge compared to the demand um, when you look at the number of people involved in the industry and the amount of territory that's being covered by, by gold money. So there's some, there's some new uh, efforts. Uh, there's been efforts for a while, but there's some new successes, but they're small. Uh, but we're but looking at those and, and going to be uh, sharing that information with policymakers in Lima um, as part of our effort to, to push for, for greater engagement by the government um, through, through legislative reform and also by, for investment by the government into these processes. The government has a lot of resources that it could bring to bear um, in the formalization process, and it needs to invest more to make the agencies that are responsible for this uh, uh, able to carry out th these initiatives. As far as the, the premiums for, um, for legal gold or non-mercury gold, they're small. Um, uh, I think I saw a report that there was like seven, 70 cent, cent, cents additional payment over um, the cost of, uh, uh, over the value of non-legal gold um, for, for a gram. It's not a huge amount, um, but there needs to be also an education about the, the reason why we pay premiums. It's just like anything where we pay for organic or we pay for fair trade, is that, there, that we need to educate the consumers about the, the, the reasons why they should be interested in supporting things that um, uh, cost a bit more and um, uh, because they, they protect the environment, they protect people's health. And uh, I think most people just are clueless as to what's going on and how much damage. Um, and this photo that Anna has behind her is just one example. I and mean, this is like, a, if people realized what was going on and could see those photos, I think that there'd be a lot more of an incentive to pay a little bit more money uh, per gram for gold. So there's these initiatives that are out there. I just think it's um, still nascent and successes are few and far between, but they exist. And uh, we're gonna keep pushing forward uh, and investing in this until we see some change. But I think that the, the drivers, the demand that Anna raised is actually a bigger aspect of it, the financial system and how to get at that. I'm not an expert on that by any means, but I think it's just like everything with the Amazon. We have to look at the economic incentives for saving the Amazon uh, and keeping trees standing versus cutting them down to produce gold or cutting them down to produce lumber or cutting them down to grow coca or soy or something else. We've got to look at the economic incentives that drive all these actions that are really behind uh, why people go to work in the Amazon and destroy it in the process because the, uh, uh, that's really, uh, I think, the solution. Over. Thanks, Gene. Uh, Enrique, you made a very strong opening statement, um, and uh, and you said that you're ready to defend uh, your your position. And so I, I'd like to um, I just like to ask you uh, to respond to those who are going to say um, that this is a job for for people that even if it's informal, even if it has the the deleterious and effects and environmental degradation that it has. Where do you propose that people who are engaged in, in ASM, small-scale illegal mining, go when it comes to uh, their, their, the, the need for survival? Where's the alternative livelihoods in, yeah. in your mind? So, yeah. so Ryan, let, let me start with first with, uh, with uh, basic information, right? So uh, in, the, uh, in the region, I'm not talking about Peru only, you know, poverty has been reduced you know, by half in some countries in the last 10, 20 years, exactly the time when gold mining is going up. The, the capacity, the income capacity has increased at the level of individual levels, not only at the, at the GDP level. Uh, so there is no clear relation between poverty and uh, uh, gold mining activities. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, and also when you think about Peruvians, in the case, 95 or 98% of Peruvians chose a different route than actually selling drugs or doing illegal gold mining. It is, uh, I guess, I base my, my, my judgment 
on the fact that it is not a really related directly related activity in relation to I don't have anything to do the every day everybody else had, to, had something to do and it, uh, made made a profit even during cold uh, during, during COVID times so uh, this is a, perce a perception that in some way has become ingrained and and we see them as the poor informal gold miners no these people who definitely have a need and definitely are, are, are finding a way that they can actually make a profit but that's the wrong way you know, in the same way as we could also justify to say, you know, go and say cocaine or go say drugs in the street or, you know, let's reduce the penalty for people who are doing uh, drug smuggling. Now, it's not that's going that way. So my, my rationale comes from from that perspective is that it is not actually uh, a reaction to poverty. It is more uh, the, the low hanging fruit that has a very low cost in sense in the sense of engaging into it. And of course, you know, for a lot of young people who are involved in this is a way to, to, in some ways, you know, start a business, you know, but again, in a way that is not illegal and second is highly detrimental, not only for them, but for the rest of, of society. Enrique, I want to stick on the, the subject of, um, uh, uh, of illegality and ask you a question about security, bring the security angle mm -hmm. Uh, into this and, and ask you, uh, how do you think countries in the region can address the security concern of, of mineral profits here? What's the best way to uh, get after some of the financing of transnational criminal activity in the region and how that intersects with the issue of illegal mining? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, illegal gold mining is in some ways is is very difficult, but in the same way, it's not as difficult as other ones are. Uh, I guess the, the more the closest similarities with narco traffic, you know. But uh, in this case, it is actually a bit easier because it requires large amounts of, for example, oil, you know, gasolina. You know, the way to control it is uh, it is more dependent on political decisions. And problem is that in most of these cases, uh, corruption is completely. Uh, Taken over uh, uh, the political uh, scenarios. I mean, think about Madre Dios. You know, uh, the previous, uh, not the current governor, but the previous government was very, very much tied up. Congress people who were running the, uh, you know, the operations for, for example, on transportation of oil and so on. So, uh, but it is easier in the sense that it's actually you can actually choke the activity uh, uh, in a better way. I don't believe so much about international trade because it's very difficult as Anna was saying. Uh, gold mining in Peru, for example, you know, Peru is the number five or six gold producer in the world. Uh, gold mining perhaps represents, and no one really knows what the number is, but estimations are between 15 to 25% of it. Uh, of course, the number has grown in the last few years, but you know, it actually gets mixed also with all these larger am amounts. Uh, I don't really see much of a, of a uh, I, I see uh, the role of the private sector to actually get in their act together in this case, uh, increasing the fines for if uh, when those illegal activities are, are found. But I personally would like to be more optimistic about influencing the world markets and, and so on and change the world over there. I, I, I mean, I, I would like to be optimistic on that. Over. Thanks, Enrique. Um... Uh, Dr. Sedostov, you, you mentioned at first, it, when you first opened your remarks, that uh, you thought Peru was doing a, a very good job with, uh, with, it, with ASM and illegal mining. Are there any other countries you'd like to point out in the region that um, are also making strides in this sense so that we can get a, a more panoramic view of, of the region? Um, okay, so let, let me just start by saying that I think that there's a lot being done in Peru. And I think there's some very interesting initiatives and the role of, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of people that are trying to solve this problem, but that does not mean that Peru has the problem under control. So when I, when I said that they're doing a good job, it means that there are people in Peru who are interested in, in solving the problem. Uh, Colombia has also started to come a lot online. Unfortunately, we have governments in Brazil and Bolivia that are promoting gold mining in the Amazon, um, both open you know, efforts by any artisanal scale or illegal miner that are not being in, enforced, and also by continuing, uh, as in the case of, of um, Brazil and the Xingu 
region, for example, actually building large scale gold mines in the Amazon, which has a whole different host of scientific and risk problems. Um, I didn't say this before, but the, the problem with large scale mining is that because they go deep, it intersects aquifers and dries up aquifers and contaminates aquifers, which has very, very long uh, and broad water quality and quantity impact. So again, the, I was not in any way supporting large scale mining. But anyway, so in Brazil and Bolivia, you have governments that, and Ven Venezuela that are absolutely promoting this activity. Uh, Guyana and Suriname are kind of blind spots. Um, a lot of people don't even really know how big of an issue it is. We, we recently recommended that international agencies should start paying more attention to what's happening in those countries. Um, so I would say that Peru is definitely the leader and Colombia is close, not, not even, well, it's, it's coming behind, but the rest still have a very long way to go. Right, right. if you allow me to... Um, Enrique, go ahead. Yeah, just allow From me your to perspective. Uh, also... No, actually, I want to reinforce what uh, Anna is saying. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Peru uh, has had progress, and I think that's a very interesting field, is joining together the monitoring capacity with uh, judiciary action or say legal action. That hasn't been seen in other countries in the way that Peru has done. And by the way, that's largely also supported by USAID uh, funds. And that's, that's actually something that is, is quite different than the rest. And also in terms of Peru, uh, their efforts on restoration are also quite interesting. Another story is if the, the restoration is a better investment or the best investment you can make in terms of conservation, that's a different, a different question. But uh, the examples that uh, partners of, of uh, USAID like Cincia, for example, have done uh, is, is in the science of it uh, is, is quite, quite remarkable. So. Thank you both very much. Gene, I want to go to you because I know that, um, that effective action and efforts here require coordination across um, you know, federal and state and municipal local governments, uh, depending upon the country we're talking about. So what does that effective framework for cooperation look like, uh, say, between the U.S. and a in a country and region, when you've got all of those, you know, layers uh, to, to work with, it can be a complex environment. Um, but but it, it's necessary to think about that that layered kind of approach. So, what does an effective framework for for cooperation look like when you've got a, a number of different governments to consider? Yeah. Well, so focusing just on Peru, um, we have different sort of agreements um, with the government and the environment sector, um, specifically related to gold. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we signed an agreement in 2017 to work among a range of USA, of US government agencies, specifically and especially State Department and USAID with, a, I think it's up to 18 different uh, ministries and agencies of the government that have some aspect to deal with the, the various problems associated with illegal gold. And so um, you know, we, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the Ministry of Mines um, have been very open to working with us, the Ministry of Environment. We have a very close working relationship, you know, long standing working relationship with the Ministry of Mines. And USAID has a big presence in the forestry sector. Um, and um, we've been a key supporter of the of the of the forestry law and and I, I think that it, it's just a it's it's a sort of long standing relationship that where we've been um, standing beside the government to help them strengthen and there's been a lot of political will here I mean we know that there's political you know issues that have been going on for for a while in Peru and some turbulence and turmoil and turnover of government but you've got a lot of capable technical people that are still in the government and still in the government agencies. There's been a move to create more um, civil service positions. And, and, um, and we just, we build off of the relationships that we've had and, um, and we support jointly. Um, the government actually has been investing a lot of money in, in environment conservation, especially in forestry. They could do more on illegal gold. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know, I think it's, it's, it's we've built a, a relationship of trust a partnership. Um, the government 
is has a lot of really committed people, um, uh, as as is as are there in the civil in civil society, and for all the ills and ills and um, issues of corruption which keep being raised, you know, there's a lot of great people here who are 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 committed to the cause, and it makes for a formula where you can keep pushing forward, and so we just keep keep at it, and it's going to take a long time to address this issue because we don't have all the solutions. So I don't know if I answered your question, but it's it's the, an investment over a long period of time in building up and in, in building a relationship where people trust us and uh, are willing to work with us and where we keep trying to go back to the science of what works and keep pushing that forward because you have corrupt, corrupt officials, maybe um, people who have interest uh, that were mentioned like a few minutes ago by Enrique, uh, especially in Madre de Dios, there's been just a host of issues with um, with corruption, and you just keep trying to bring the science back and saying, "But we've got to deal with these health issues. We've got to deal with this these environmental issues." And um, I've just I've seen uh, a movement basically slowly growing to address these issues um, with commitment, and we need to do more to educate the public so that we keep building. I think uh, again, mothers. Uh, parents uh, concerned about the health of their children. Um, and, um, you know, slowly we have a coalition around gold. Unfortunately, because of the, the pandemic, there's, and political reasons and transition in the government, um, there's been a, a reduction, I think, in the investment by the government in um, addressing this issue. Um, there's been less follow up on the Operation Mercurio, which was a huge initiative in 2018, to a, and a huge initiative by the government to shut down. Um, illegal gold mining in the Pampa. Um, and with, with the pandemic, we've seen um, basically miners coming back into the fields and taking advantage of the fact that the government wasn't um, able to get out and about, um, but the legal miners were and the narcos were, and we've seen an explosion of criminal activity uh, during these last few years. And the challenge is even bigger than it was before. So, you know, but we're committed to this. Um, we just signed you know, up for another five years of work and support to the government here. Uh, State Department's committed to it, um, investing in addressing, strengthening the, the fiscal, the prosecutor's office of environmental crimes. We're working with them. And um, so, you know, I think that the, 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 my recommendation is it's a long process. There's ups and downs, there's wins and losses, and we're gonna keep at this. Um, and we don't have all the answers yet, but we're, we're gonna keep doing research and I'm really excited about this project with Conservation X Labs, which is going to be presenting sort of sort of innovative ideas that can be scaled to address these issues. Um, I think that looking you know broadly at, at uh, solutions with with as many people who want to participate in this conversation is the way to go, so that we can um, find creative ideas that could be scaled that maybe most of us would never have thought of. And that's going to be something to watch for in February. We're going to have the first announcement of those of those projects that we're going to support um, to, to uh, test and trial and potentially bring to scale. Over. Thanks, Gene. That's fantastic uh, to hear the, the all, all the elements of the, of the partnership. Um, I want to remind participants in the, the webinar that you can ask a question to our, our panelists by typing it into the Q&A uh, chat function here in, in your Zoom screen, or you can go to the event webpage and click on the button that says ask live questions. And we're gonna to get to your questions in a second. But the, the last question from me uh, can be for any of you. And it's just a, a quick thought on the role of the private sector here. Uh, it came up, I think, in, in all three introductory remarks. And uh, what do you, just quickly, what do you think the role of the private sector is in, in reducing ASM and illegal mining? We often hear that that maybe they're not doing enough, and so if, if that's your position, what could be the private sector's role? Uh, Dr. Setterstuff, you, you've got your hand up right away, so I'll go to you first, but I'll allow others to chime in after you. Sorry. Um, there are different private sectors for starters, right? So there is... Um, I think that there is something that the mining industry, the large scale mining in industry could do right away, which is to really start examining their practices of where and how they're buying gold. 
um, to supplement the gold that they are actually mining and also to manage their mercury flows because mercury is produced as a side product of large scale gold mining. Mercury and gold love each other, basically. And so where there's gold, there's mercury. So when large scale mines operate, they almost always produce mercury, which they then sell <laughs> to other miners of smaller scale who use it to attract gold and, and produce gold. And then those miners often sell the gold back to the larger companies. It's not as clean of a, it's not as clean of a process of sale as that one company is both selling the gold and uh, selling the mercury and buying the gold necessarily, but that's how it flows. So the private sector in the mining industry could could adopt, for example, the IRMA standards, which are the it's an initiative the, the initiative for responsible mining, uh, which has a section on being careful about who, where you're buying gold from and, and what you might be doing to contribute to the process of greenwashing or laundering gold. So that's one thing. And then I do think that the financial industry needs to look at what kind of instruments are they selling in the financial sector that are basically allowing investors to, to, to invest in gold perhaps unwittingly, not understanding the impact that they're having. We have a fairly significant global campaign to divest from fossil fuel companies. Well, I consider that there should be a similar global campaign to, for investors and countries to divest from gold. So that, those would be my two suggestions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sedasov. And Enrique, you've got your hand up. Yeah, and just to add to what Anna said, uh, there are a number of companies, well, put it this way. Uh, the, uh, for example, if you think about gold mining today, a lot of it is, 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 the, is being done with caterpillars, you know, with big tractors and big machinery. And there are only a few companies who dominate the whole market, you know, and they are being part, they are partners in crime, you know, and the same goes for uh, some of the gold mining companies who may not be on purpose or who knows what, you know, are acting as, 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 as I don't know how you translate that, blanqueadores, you know, uh, like basically washing, you know, um, uh, dirty money, uh, but basically be, be uh, agents for um, bringing mercury to, to, um, to the system. But I would actually uh, uh, start with the idea that uh, gold mining, illegal gold mining in the Amazon, again, in the Amazon, I, I highlight that fact, you know, should be related to issues like, for example, uh, 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 children uh, trafficking or all these uh, social illnesses that are very clear and very, very uh, impactful in, 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 any, in any perspective. And basically, uh, it's kind of like the blood diamonds, but it basically make, com make companies uh, who are involved in these uh, activities. Again, big companies. I'm not talking about a small guy who's selling caterpillars. These are the major companies who are also providing machinery for the mining industry. They have to be more careful because it is very easy to know where the tractors go. You know, they are not small things. They are not like mercury. You know, uh, and the number of tractors you see now, for example, operating in Suriname, in Guyana, in Colombia, in Peru, it's tremendous. You're talking about thousands and thousands. So that's that's an easy one. Anyway, I just threw one. Thanks, Enrique. Jean, do you have any quick thoughts on, on private sector? Well, I think that Enrique is absolutely right on these two points, um, or and both both Anna and Enrique, um, that, that there needs to be more done to, um, to to target the companies that are selling the equipment, selling mercury, and also to educate investors about the gold sector. Um, and you could see, um, I, I believe you can see some measurable impact on the, the materials needed to, to do it, to carry out illegal gold or to mercury based and artisanal gold um, that is that is environmentally and, and health wise unsustainable. Um, and, uh, and I think this is something like a good policy recommendation or a good project recommendation for us to be looking at. We already have lots of educational material and and uh, journalistic research um, and reports that can be shared uh, with a campaign that would be uh, the kind that Anna uh, described to educate investors about what's happening in the sector. Um, and that's something that we're just generating all the time, especially through the project with Cincia and other, other researchers. 
And so we've got a lot of the, the beginnings of that kind of a, an initiative. And I, and I really think that um, we need to, to get more buy-in. Obviously there's companies that are selling gold, like jewelry that I mentioned, Tiffany's, um, Walmart, you know, QBC, big, big vendors of gold in the US that have signed on um, to address this issue. And, and you can build off of that. And so there's, there's you know, again, I think we're at the beginning of the realization in the world that we have to deal with this. And especially because the price of gold has gone up so much in the last few years, and there's just been a boom in, in gold. And, uh, and we need to relate it to these other issues of, of the petroleum industry and the damage that that does, or to the, to the diamond industry and the human rights violations, and get people to think about gold in a new way, because most people do not think about gold as being uh, as related to deforestation anywhere. I, I mean, the average person in the United States is not gonna understand that. They need to be informed. Um, and there needs to be more campaigns um, to address, to, 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 do, to, 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 to take that message to the general public and to these major companies. Thank you, Gene. I wanna take some questions from the audience. We've had a lot of questions come in and the, the chat box is, is burgeoning with more questions. Um, to, uh, to, to Anna, you, you mentioned that you know, mercury and gold are, are moving together. Where you find gold, there's mercury. Where you find mercury, there, there's gold. We've got a question uh, from the audience about nationwide mercury abatement policies and whether they've been effective at limiting small-scale artisanal illegal mining, or are there other inputs that can be easily substituted if mercury supplies were, in fact, successfully restricted? There are other ways of mining for gold. They are not necessarily less damaging. That you can use cyanide. Um, there, are, there are methods that you can use the mercury, if you're using mercury, in a way that basically collects the mercury and recycles it so that you're preventing it from escaping into the atmosphere, escaping into the river. But but as far as if, you, if you're asking for the economically feasible solution of what, what's my other technology, there are a few very, very small scale initiatives of non-mercury non ASM, but really they are, um, it, it, it's not the economically viable method to use. And, and so I would say that there isn't really a great solution to that problem. And again, we need to remember that at least my argument would be that the, the goal here is not to make mining sustainable, it is to stop the mining. Another factor that many people are not aware of is that the soils in the Amazon contain high amounts of mercury in and of themselves. So you can actually look at soils in mined areas like this and in some places you will find that they have much less mercury con concentration than the, the forested area next door. Well, that's because as the dirt was being disturbed and spread all over the place, the mercury escaped. Yeah. And so the added mercury is not even the only source of mercury that comes from the mining in the Amazon. And so, <clears throat> no, there aren't really great technologies except for the recycling of the mercury that does have impact and help the health of the people who are actually there doing the mining and the community surrounding the mining. Um, but for the Amazon, I would certainly not recommend, for example, cyanide mining. Um, so Enrique wants to add something to that, I think. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add that one uh, important detail is that in the case of Peru, uh, uh, most of the mercury comes from Bolivia. It is being smuggled from Bolivia. If you look at the numbers of, uh, uh, of tons that Bolivia imports, it's huge. Peru imports much smaller than Bolivia, but Peru is the one that uses uh, the, the mercury from Bolivia. So there is an issue there of, of smuggling, which is hard to control because as Anna is saying, you know, a kilo of mercury is a bottle this big. Uh, uh, um, but, you know, this is something that in the same way as, as we try to control uh, narco traffic, you know, uh, mercury should be along the same lines. Yeah, what is happening between Bolivia and Peru is similar to what is happening between Ecuador and, and Peru. Peru is the main exporter of, of uh, um, 
shark fins uh, when Peru hardly uh, harvests and is mainly coming from Ecuador. So it's kind of like goes through the borders and the legality continues. Thank you, Enrique. Don't go anywhere. I have a good question for you that's just come in the, the Q&A. Um, and it's about, it's a two-part question. I'm, I'm actually combining two, two questions here. Um, El Salvador recently adopted the view that you propose in your opening statement. Uh, that is viewing mining as a health issue where health costs far outweigh the economic benefits. And they're one of the few countries that have uh, taken this view and decided to ban mining. Is there a movement to, to ban mining uh, in Peru and in the Amazon writ large akin to the one that you described in your opening statement? So give us, the question is kind of getting at, give us a sense of what the politics of this um, yeah. are in the moment. And then the, the second part of the question is, uh, from the health perspective, you know, it hinges on educating people on the dangers of, of mercury. Um, and we, we had someone ask, how do you convince miners who are especially reluctant to believe uh, that, that, that this is a dangerous activity? How do you convince them um, that, that mercury is dangerous? How do you propose that we present the information to people? Yeah, uh, all right, so uh, let me start with the, uh, the case of uh, health issues. Uh, there have been a number of studies uh, uh, and there are some that are actually being now and I understand that uh, a number of people who are related to some of the institutions like Cincia, for example, are now focusing on the health issues and it's starting to, to, to actually grow up as a, as a, as a major interest. Uh, but it is uh, not only a matter of getting the right information, but it's also a matter of how, what to do with that information. I think about uh, other types of um, problems like AIDS, for example, you know, big campaigns on AIDS, and you can change the attitude at a personal level. I, um, I would actually uh, leave for the communicators, which can sell you in Paris City if they want, you know, uh, to have in their hands this issue or this challenge to how to make the health issues the primary issues, you know, which should be uh, the ones that every person will have, uh, every mother, you know, is concerned about their children, it's about their own health. And we need to actually have a better communications and of course, focus our research. Not, doesn't, doesn't mean leave, for example, uh, research on fish or other animals, mercury. No, don't, don't leave that. That's interesting and it also uh, adds up. But we need to actually beef up the information that is there on mercury uh, impacts. Um, and I, I, I trust that we can make a change. And let me give you, uh, I hope not to extend too much in this question, but let me give you an example. You know, uh, years ago, you know, in Peru, uh, there was an attempt by a government to replace uh, uh, the milk that is given in every school. There is a program in Peru called the Vaso Leche, the glass of milk, which every kid gets in a school every day. You know, uh, and the government tried to replace cow milk by soy milk. The mothers actually understood very well that that was not really cool. And they actually went to the, to the main plaza in Lima and lay flat and they immediately changed, you know, the whole uh, attempt, the policy attempt to change, you know, the use of milk. Where I'm going to is that there are some people who are more uh, um, uh, important in that sense that are mothers, you know, who are actually understanding that they, uh, that the kids or should understand that the kids are being poisoned. And also, and other studies are showing that the cognitive ability of kids is actually way, way more impacted by, uh, by mercury than other things. So anyway, you know, uh, adopting a policy uh, of, well, adopting a health uh, related, um, um, human trafficking related, uh, and all the prostitution and, and the other problems that are associated with, with uh, gold mining is a way to go to the point where uh, families can be convinced and the ones that make the decisions, which at the end are, are the mothers and, and the women in, in, in these areas. Over. Thank you, Enrique. Jean, I've got a question for you on the, um, uh, on the innovative solutions uh, that you plan to support under the, the challenge program. Could you give a, a, or provide some short descriptions of the kinds of innovative solutions that USAID plans to support? I have to admit that I'm not on the committee that's been uh, selecting these solutions and they haven't been announced yet. So I can't answer that question, but it's, it'll be announced in February 
um, and the website for what information is public yet uh, would be the Conservation X Labs, and it's the Artisanal um, uh, Gold Mining Challenge. And I apologize, I, I uh, will have that information in, in a few weeks, but I don't have it yet. But we're, like I said, we're really looking forward to seeing what they are, and everybody should watch, uh, watch for that to come out. Um, they've had some interesting successes in other areas, and these challenges uh, are uh, what I like about any of this stuff. It's sort of uh, crowdsourcing. You know, don't just think you know your NGO or your university, but open it up to the world and say who you know anywhere in the world has solutions, and that's what we're we're asking right now. Great, thanks, Gene. Uh, so, to the the person who asked that question, uh, just sit put a couple more weeks, and and you'll have some some answers on on the innovative solutions front. Um, another question, and I, I want to pose this one to the to the entire panel um, because I think we've discussed the security angle to uh, ASM and, and illegal mining, but I don't think we've gone into it with any sort of uh, depth. Is um, it's about Colombia uh, specifically. And uh, what, what can the USG do to help Colombia and the region get a grip on uh, the gold mining situation? What we've seen recently with the Colombian guerrilla in the, in the borderlands, I think is quite frightening and some of, some of the human toll uh, that that's had and, uh, and, and how this ties into uh, overall criminal economies as well as as Venezuela, uh, the, the person who's asking the question notes that this is really a hemispheric security problem with a lot of intersections uh, with, the, with the illegal mining that threatens peace in Colombia, the future of Venezuela. It's so difficult to, to uh, you know, look at these issues in, in isolation. So uh, just asking folks on the panel to reflect maybe once more on the security element of this with specific attention to the Colombian uh, guerrilla. Enrique, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I got distracted and one reading one of the answers. Um, I mean, I missed the question. I'm sorry. Right. Sure. It is. It, what What can we do uh, to help Colombia and the region uh, get a grip on the growing control of the Colombian guerrilla and Ooh. what they, the the control that they have on gold mining uh, and and especially in in Venezuela? This is really a hemispheric security problem threatens peace in Colombia, threatens peace in, in other parts of the, of the region, as well as the future of Venezuela. Yeah, that, that's a hard one. And I, I really um, don't know what the, the right answer would be. Uh, I, I think that it is also very much similar to what we see of the link of deforestation and, and so on uh, with uh, uh, guerrillas and narco traffic. And, uh, when talking to Colombians, uh, there you hear very different opinions, but in general, it is a uh, response to the lack of presence of, of a government and, and, and the services that governments sh should support uh, in rural areas. But uh, I, don't, I don't feel qualified to answer. I don't really don't know the solution in the case of Colombia. Um, similar stories are actually seen in other parts uh, in relation to um, um, guerrillas or narco guerrillas and like the, the Peru is another case you know, um, and it's, it's, um, it's not a difference in that sense uh, to the Colombian issue um, but I don't I don't have a, a coherent answer to that question sorry Dr. Stadisov well again I am absolutely not a expert on this particular topic with respect to Colombia but I do think that there is a still a lot that can be done with respect to as far as international law enforcement agencies and experts can both help map the criminal networks and their political ties, because those political ties are very important, um, and show the links that they have to illegal mining. Um, and there still needs to be a lot of capacity building with respect to the agencies or, or forces in the different countries of the Amazon. Um, as far as how to how to really detect and challenge money laundering and trafficking, trafficking, there also needs to be a lot of uh, capacity buildings as far as customs and borders issues, which is not really 
the one related to security in, in, in this case in Colombia. But I think that there's a lot of international capacity building and collaboration that can be done to help the national governments better address some of these issues as they are linked to gold mining. Um, and then there could also be a collaboration by, within CAN, Mercosur, Prosur, and Unisur, um, as far as adopting shared stances and policies and, and really collaborating together better. Um, so information about the, the routes and the trafficking, that gathering, because those routes change also constantly, it needs to be constant and, and long-term. So I, th I think that there is capacity building that can be done uh, and helping the government's track. Thanks, Dr. Sarsov. Jean, uh, do you care to, to chime in here and feel free to, to punt since this isn't a Peru issue, um, not a Peru question? Um, yeah, I'm gonna punt on, on that one. No problem. Uh, so I'm mindful of the time. I know that we've got about four or five minutes left. I wanna ask each one of you if you would like to make any final remarks, anything that we've missed uh, throughout the course of our events. There are plenty of questions that unfortunately we didn't have time to get to. I think there are some questions in the chat box that we answered throughout our dialogue, but I wanna give each one of you a chance to make about a minute or a minute and a half of closing remarks and final reflections on the time we've spent together. And I'll start with you, Enrique, and then I'll go to Dr. Sederstoff, and then I'll finish with you, Jean. Uh, let, let me first answer one of the questions that was in the board, uh, Maureen, who was uh, asking about uh, the, uh, the ban of uh, the mining bans. Uh, yes, a, part, part a, one of the question. Yeah, there, there is a, um, an interesting experience that happened in Peru. Uh, and by the way, you know, uh, this, the uh, scandal of um, uh, Amazonian gold mining, you know, became very, very strong uh, in the beginning of the, well, started in 2008, it was very strong in 2010. And there were uh, a number of military operations, police and military operations. Uh, and they were, um, uh, which were, were basically focusing on areas where not, were illegal, where gold mining wasn't allowed. It was allowed in what they call the, the, the mining corridor, uh, as well as in protected areas and indigenous territories. And uh, it didn't work because most of these cases of these uh, 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 operative of, of enforcement you know, were like three days long, you know, and basically uh, all the miners hit their, their equipment and they just came back. But there is another one that, uh, that I started, uh, uh, I think it's like three years ago, which is called uh, Operación Mercurio, I think it's called, I don't remember the name. Um, and that one actually was very effective, which to the point where it reduced uh, gold mining by 93%. 93%, this is not a small number. You know, and you question, you may question, you know, so what happened? Did people die of hunger? No, they just went somewhere else and did something else like every other Peruvian. You know, so it is not so much of a, of a, of a poverty issue as it sounds. Definitely everybody wants to make money, uh, but uh, most of people actually choose the right way. Uh, 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 but anyway, um, and, but in terms of uh, closing remarks, I think, uh, is one of the things that I, I was mentioning during my, 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 my opening remarks is that we need to actually change what is the, the emphasis of our battle. Now, it is not an environmental issue. Now, of course, it has an impact on the environment, but in some ways it's, 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 a, it's a minor one compared to other ones, you know, in each of the countries where, where, it, where it happens. Now, it is, uh, the, the emphasis has to be non-environmental, uh, uh, and then that in includes involving other types of authorities within governments, be ministries of health, be ministries of, of uh, women or human rights or, or whatever is the case of each country. The, uh, when we made the issue an environmental one, uh, we screwed up. Uh, and and I, I, I hope that we can rephrase and retake the, uh, the emphasis which is more on the human side. And I believe we're gonna make a, a change in that direction. It has proven that the environmental side hasn't worked, you know, and, 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 um, and I hope that we cannot repeat in the same, the same story. Uh, and also um, uh, linking the uh, illegal gold mining as the issue of a poverty issue, it is not. You know, um, uh, once we do that, then we can actually 
face the problem in a different way. Okay. Thanks, Enrique. Dr. Sersoff? Um, well, I guess I would like to reflect on the two real strategies. <laughs> one is to be strategic, and the other one is to work as a tribe. And so I think this, this is a project or a problem that needs a lot of countries around the globe. Within each country, it needs all kinds of different sectors, the environmental, the mining, the health, the um, customs, in some places, the police and the military. So it needs the communities and it needs to be working together with the affected people. So what we really need to do is when we're designing and developing and implementing strategies, we need to be using those strategies and to be building a tribe, a tribe that's united by a, a goal, a common goal, which in this case needs to be to stop the impact that the gold mining is having. And so to really encourage that collaboration and to try to break down beyond the traditional boundaries of parties that don't work with each other and to be able to reach out and, and really think about how do we get the best brains and, and, and organizations working together. So that's the first one. And the second one is that as humans, we tend to get stuck in doing what we're doing. You know, so the, the strategic thinking requires thinking about where we are today and where do we need to go? And, and what is the gap that we need to bridge in order to get from point A to point B? And then you need to reflect on, is what I am doing today actually going to get me from point A to point B? And if it's not, then I'm probably wasting my time, right? And so to think about what are those strategies, what are those really much more forceful pressure points that could generate greater change. And I would suggest that two of those are for the US government to really think about how to better regulate the trade and, and, and transport of gold. And for the financial sector globally to think about how it is contributing to the problem that we're seeing in the Amazon, which in turn impacts climate change. So. Those would be, that would be my closing. Thank you, Dr. Sedosov. And finally, over to you, Gene, your final reflections and concluding remarks. Yeah, I think that, uh, again, we have the beginnings of solutions, and I agree that we need to, to have people work together uh, more effectively. I also think more resources, financial resources, um, need to be invested in addressing um, this issue. It's something that we work on constantly with, um, the, with the Ministry of Economy and Finance here to get budget allocations made in the areas where we're helping develop solutions or build institutions. And so I think that um, that's something that we need to continue as an international community to, to promote uh, that kind of engagement with the government uh, uh, and the governments that are willing to work on this issue. I, it's another problem, though, if you don't have political will in other countries, uh, some of the countries that Anna mentioned, um, you know, the, 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 they're going the opposite direction. So it's, uh, it's a real challenge. Um, and then I just wanted to, to point out um, that in the Q&A, uh, Anjali Kumar posted, she's a project manager for the, for the Conservation X uh, Grand Challenge. Uh, she posted the link and she also posted a couple of additional links for some of the pilot projects that have been run in Guyana and Peru. And then, um, uh, some more details about the upcoming uh, cohort of projects that will be pilot testing uh, in the near future. And so uh, this is where you can find out more information about that project and, and about some of the solutions that are going to be proposed. And so I'd encourage uh, folks to, to look at that. Um, and, you know, we just have to keep uh, moving forward. I, I, I agree. I, 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 don't think it's just a health issue, though. I'll just say that I think it. We have to keep looking at both sides of it: environment and health. And um, and everybody needs to recognize that we have to we have to stop deforestation in the Amazon. I mean, the the planet, the climate stability of the of the of the planet that we all live on depends on this, and it's that big of a deal. It's an existential threat, and illegal gold mining is contributing directly to the viability of our climate for the future of uh, you know, our children and our grandchildren. We've got to deal with this issue. 
And everybody needs to be aware of that, made aware of that, just like we're seeing in other areas like blood diamonds or with the oil sector and uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions. We all need to realize this is a, a big deal. And uh, I think we're not there yet with the general public. And, uh, and I agree with Enrique, mothers, get to the mothers about the mercury issue. That, you know, that is motivating to them to understand what's happening to their kids. Um, but we, all of these pieces, we, we're continuing to work with all these different aspects and uh, it's, it, we've got a long road to go. A long way to go and a long road. It's a, it's a, but it's, I'm optimistic that we're going to see positive progress. And, um, and we just thank all the people who've been listening today to, uh, for that and to share this information with, um, with their institutions. And uh, you know, we need to keep working on this. Over. Thanks very much, Gene. This has been a fantastic conversation. I think we've established we could have gone on for, for much, much longer, and there's just so much more work to do. And I'm sure um, CSIS will have more events on this in the future. Uh, but for now, Mr. Gene Thomas, Mission Director of the United States Agency for International Development in Peru, Dr. Anna Sedestoff, the Deputy Executive Director of the Inter-American Association for Environmental Defense, and Mr. Enrique Ortiz, the Senior Director Senior Program Director of the Andes Amazon Fund. Thank you all so much for being with us. We hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.